of all the themes that weave together to create the Dune series, Frank Herbert's portrayal of ecology and environmental issues on a planetary scale is perhaps the singular subject that the novels are most noted for. Although the series is most often identified with the theme of ecology, its predominance within the story diminishes in later books in favour of the treatments of evolution and the destructive hero. Like all good science fiction, Dune is very much a product of its times, reviewing as it does the state of the world's current affairs and extrapolating them forwards to an atavistic society many thousands of years in the future. The early 60s represent a turning point in science fiction, what Thomas D. Clarison refers to as a cul-de-sac, where we see science fiction beginning to turn its back on the attitudes created in the golden era of science fiction, and head steadily forwards to the realisation of what is often perceived as a mainly British new wave. However, the subversive nature of Dune and Stranger in a Strange Land can be viewed as a response to a very general malaise within American science fiction, and in light of their representations to the concerns and ongoing social upheavals of the 1960s, can be regarded as being very much a leading part of an American new wave. The 60s brought about great social upheaval following an era where many had been anaesthetised by the end of World War II. The growing concerns that followed including the dawn of the nuclear age and the beginning of a global awareness towards the damage done to the Earth's environment. The beginning of the environmental movement can be seen as existing in the works of the early ecologists and natural scientists, but its increasing momentum in the awareness of the general public really came in the early 1960s. One work that paved the way for a greater concern of the general public towards environmental problems was Silent Spring written by the American marine biologist Rachel Carson. The work highlighted concerns of the use of pesticides on the natural environment, looking at their harmful effects on the bird population and ultimately the human population. Of particular notes were Carson's concerns over dichlorodiphenyltrichloroethane, or DDT, a by now infamous synthetic pesticide used to combat malaria. Silent Springs publication is now seen as a fundamental factor in the resulting campaign against the pesticide, which resulted in it being banned in 1972. As much as Silent Spring is a book credited with spurring the dramatic increase in environmental awareness, it is also seen as a book that would help popularise works such as Herbert's Dune, Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, and Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. All of these books would emerge as college campus favourites in the early 60s and all feature strong environmental and messianic themes. Heinlein's novel brought science fiction into mainstream literary culture for the first time, becoming the first hardback science fiction novel to reach the bestsellers lists. It offered a version of the genre, however, that exaggerated the elements of messianism, right libertarianism, and regressive exploration of sexuality that had always been present in Heinlein's writing. Tolkien's fantasy was recontextualised as a counter-industrial, counter-modern allegory, speaking to the ecological consciousness beginning to be articulated by campaigners like Rachel Carson, and which informed the counterculture interest in self-sufficient communalism and environmental politics. Herbert Dune, still commonly voted the greatest science fiction novel, was received in that context too with its detailed depiction of the delicately balanced desert ecology of the planet Arrakis, and in an imagined universe where the interplanetary community has actively decided to exclude computer machineries for fear of autonomous cybernetic control. Brian Herbert also sees the impact of Carson's Silent Spring on the awakening environmental movement of the 1960s, and Frank Herbert and his ecological ideas. Discussing the layering of Dune as an ecological handbook, he notes the timing of Dune's release, 1963 in magazine format, in relation to events occurring in the United States of America. Environmental awareness was just awakening in the early 1960s, and Frank Herbert was one of the standard bearers. In 1962, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, a monumental work that decried the killing of birds and harmless insects by toxic chemicals such as DDT. In 1963, shortly before the opening instalments of Dune were published by Analog, the first Clean Air Act was passed in the United States. President Kennedy gave a couple of speeches that year 
about protecting the environment. Timothy O'Reilly also notes that the control of nature as discussed by Carson was an important sub-theme in Dune, and the novel that followed The Green Brain. The Green Brain in particular concentrates on this idea with the Carsonites that are mentioned therein, an obvious nod to Rachel Carson's growing influence. The popularity of these works in particular highlights an affinity of science fiction with not just its traditional readership, but also the emerging and diverse counterculture of the 60s. Patrick Parander discusses the shift of science fiction during this period to a more liberal and sometimes more radical position. His suggestion is to examine the works of science fiction which have won both the Hugo and Nebula awards as a good indication of not just popularity of a given work amongst readers, but also amongst writers. This indication, as he points out using Herbert's Dune as an example of the first book to do so, confirmed the existence of an axis between science fiction and alternative culture when it was recommended as an ecological primer in the last Whole Earth catalogue. The 60s also represent a re-emergence of science fiction as a popular form of literature and as a genre that was slowly lifting itself out of the mass of American pulp fiction amongst which it had lain since the early 20s. As Patrick Parander points out, science fiction in the post-1960 period is produced and consumed on a larger scale than ever before, and in looking at American science fiction from the 60s onwards, discusses the overall failure of science fiction novels to sell well, noting that between 1965 and 1977, the Dune trilogy seems to be an all-time bestseller. When questioning what it is about the expansion of science fiction into a wider cultural sphere of awareness during this period, he looks at the phenomenon from a cultural angle and suggests that the popularity of hard science fiction comes from an enchantment with technology. However, the malaise of disenchantment has favoured escapist science fantasy and such ecologically concerned bestsellers as Dune. Dune's fame comes more than anything from its ecological awareness and never before seen detail of an entire world transformed by external environmental factors, where every facet of life upon it is perpetually dangerous to those who live there, forcing the Fremen people to integrate the ecology of their world into every single aspect of their daily lives. The level of exactness of Dune's ecological depiction is as much a part of the difficulty that we have in categorising the work. However, those who view Dune as hard science fiction do so because of its ecological message. Those who would view Dune as soft science fiction do so because it combines this rigorous scientific detail with what seemingly appears to be common tropes of fantasy fiction, though I would argue that this is again a misunderstanding of the atavistic society created by the prohibitions of the Butlerian Jihad. Luckhurst states, that the plot of Dune uses all the apparatus of heroic fantasy, while Clarison also takes this view, believing that, despite the science fiction trappings, this is the stuff of heroic fantasy. Peter Stockwell also follows suit in discussing the typologies of utopias present in science fiction, where he takes the view that Dune is an example of an escape to the past, ostensibly set on another planet, but appearing very much like a return to a medieval utopia. This implication here is that because elements of hard science fiction representing one aspect of the author's desire to explore a given theme are combined with another theme which is less focused around science and technology, then the former is cancelled out by the latter. My own point of contention here lies in the fact that Dune may appear to have the trappings of heroic fantasy, primarily because a great deal of fantasy literature contains the trappings of mythology but it is an appearance, which may nonetheless help to continue to generate interest in the series. John Schoenher's artwork also does much to create a fantasy feel for the series, but as it progresses it sheds this appearance in favour of a very futuristic feel, especially in Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune. Herbert's Dune is immersed in mythology and this together with the combination of an atavistic society created out of the Butlerian Jihad and the Faufri-like social system embedded in its Imperium, also lend elements to a pseudo-medieval appearance. Thus, for example, we have a world where warriors prefer to fight with knives rather than las guns. Dune still remains grounded in a reality we realise stems from the time of its publication, 
and adheres to the concepts we may understand as being part of what we call science fiction. Although there are elements of mysticism and hocus pocus common to fantasy and horror literature, they are in fact tools of the politically astute used to manipulate and control both individuals and whole communities, separated in a far flung universe by light years of space. The results of how a people are used and manipulated based around the mystical evolutionary dreams of transforming their harsh world is a key presentation of the Dune series' narrative. In this sense, Dune represents environmentalism as part of a religious or mythical ecology. Joan Slonczewski and Michael Levy also follow this viewpoint, though their focus of detraction comes rather from the use of PARs in Dune, which are consistent with the superhuman mutations and evolutions more analogous to the Van Vautian heroes which John W. Campbell was championing in Astounding Stories and Analog magazines. Frank Herbert's Dune portrays living ecosystems in mechanistic detail consistent with contemporary ecological science, yet the same book depicts people with extrasensory powers and memories of past lives that are inconsistent with fundamental science. Adam Roberts presents a lengthy discussion of this ever increasing trend in his analysis of the relationship between magic and technology. He notes that in this trend there is an inherent tendency for hard science fiction to align itself closer to soft science fiction and vice versa. The dialectic between science and magic, or fact and mysticism, or rationalism and religion, actively informs all the major classics of 20th century science fiction. That Metropolis, or Dune, or Star Wars, or Stan Robinson's Mars books, or the Matrix films all articulate precisely this dynamic, and do so for deep reasons connected to the determining history of the genre. In light of that, he goes on to say that Dune is, at the very least, a novel which connects with a particular aspect of the traditions of science fiction anti technological, mystical, and transcendent. Dune then is lauded though not always, for its ecological approach, but criticised for writing on the tales of lesser regarded tropes of science fiction. To say that Dune depicts people with ESP is in one sense quite correct. The abilities of the Bene Gesserit for example coming from their training programme that allows control over one's physical and mental talents. There are various mental abilities portrayed in the Dune series, but they are often depicted as talents acquired from the prescriptions of the Butlerian Jihad, and are more often attributable to observation of minutiae in the languages of human beings, physical and verbal, Herbert's interest in general semantics being the major influence. Elements of hard science and technology that detract from any given understanding of mankind's current technological state at the time of writing are done more for entertaining than any desire to be accurate. Investigating ESP was an interest of Herbert's, and was certainly a subject becoming popular in the 50s and 60s, trying to come under a veneer of respectability by renaming the subject under the heading of parapsychology. ESP is one of my interests to the extent that I have done considerable reading on it in what I would call the quasi-scientific end of the field. This includes René Sutra's Parapsychology and a considerable amount of J. B. Ryan including The Reach of the Mind and New World of the Mind. I have also dabbled in Puharic, the Sacred Mushroom Writer. I am what you might refer to as an agnostic where ESP is concerned, a doubting Thomas. Some of the writers on this end of the field, such as Fodor and Tassi, are too cooky for my tastes, and I have strong doubts as to the mathematical basis for the statistics of Ryan's tests. Ok, I am from Missouri. This does not, however, limit my enjoyment of a good ESP story, or stay in my imagination in exploring the what-ifs of possible mental powers. Herbert's own desire to not explain every facet of science, technology, politics, or even the raison d'etre for creating such a ridiculously dangerous thing as a quiz at Saderach, are left to the imagination as little mysteries that continue to involve the reader in Herbert's universe long after they have finished reading the books. As he himself said, I refuse, however, to provide further answers to this complex mixture. You find your own solutions, don't look to me as your leader. 
It is perhaps for that reason that Dune is indeed a book that rewards the reader who returns to its pages again and again. However, the portrayal of elements of its story outside of a hard science fiction viewpoint is perhaps one of the features of Herbert's work that allowed it to not descend into an unsolvable maze, giving it just the right amount of complexity to not perplex most readers. Regardless of its attitudes to other elements of science fiction and real life science and technology, ecology is Dune's main thematic approach in relation to human science, and for this it is clearly praised by even the most stalwart of critics and scientists. Frank Herbert's work in the Dune series was as R.J. Ellis noted, symptomatic of the developing awareness of ecology during the 1950s and 60s. This ecological awareness took on an apocalyptic tone, as shown in the works which heavily influenced Frank Herbert, especially Carson's Silent Spring and Paul Sears' Where There Is Life. The ecological bandwagon was on the move, and much of Herbert's motivations about his theme of the dangerous hero hijacking this movement came from his increasing awareness of the subject, and especially the tone environmentalism was taking. Fear is the mind killer is enshrined in the philosophy of Paul Atreides, and central to Herbert's own concerns over society mindlessly following individuals who use those fears for their own advancement. Herbert was certainly not the first to offer concerns about ecology in science fiction. One of the most popular environmental trends in science fiction up until the 1960s, albeit one that continues today, was that of the ecological disaster novel of which there are numerous examples amongst quality science fiction and the broader pulp works. The ecological disaster followed in the mode of the Thames Valley disaster novels of the late 19th century, which included works such as W.D. Hayes' The Doom of the Great City, Robert Barr's The Doom of London, Richard Jeffries' After London, and Grant Allen's The Thames Valley Catastrophe. Many of these novels featured apocalyptic scenarios on a localised scale, often by means of some natural environmental disaster of biblical proportions. H. G. Wells's The War of the Worlds follows very much in this vein, describing how the Martians rampage through the Thames Valley area, and is described by the novel's narrator in the form of a travelogue, as the Martians attack the more interesting aspects of the London landscape. The Martians, representing man in a higher evolved form, are of course the destructive element here, but it is the arrival of a plant from Mars, the red weed, that seems to cause the most damage to the earth, overwhelming the local indigenous flora. The suggestion is that the plants cover the world of Mars and are what create its red hue. Interpretations vary on its purpose, but the obvious which I believe is that the red weed is part of the invasion and is used to help terraform the earth into a world habitable for the Martians. In the end, the plants succumb to the Earth's bacteria just like the Martian invaders, but they do however represent a very real environmental threat. One notable science fiction work which has a number of similarities to Dune was George R. Stewart's Earth Abides. Stewart's novel of life in America following the devastation of human beings by an apocalyptic plague bears little relationship to Dune on the surface but it does feature some stylistic modes that make similarities between the two works more apparent. Earth Abides features a number of documents intersecting the narrative that discuss the history of mankind from the event of the plague, and represent almost a backward narrative of human civilization. This is reminiscent of the various historical documents that inform the reader in the Dune series, providing them almost with a sense of prescience or future history of the narrative. The story follows the tale of Ish Williams, a graduate student who seemingly survives the devastating plague because of a snake bite he receives, while researching his thesis entitled The Ecology of the Black Creek Area. Ish begins to travel and observes the new quiet world based on his training, occasionally finding small pockets of humanity. Ish, noting how some of the survivors he occasionally meets are failing to cope with this post apocalyptic world, fears for humanity's survival. He eventually settles down and marries a woman he meets called M, and helps found a community that functions as a tribal society. As the years pass, Ish attempts to educate and instill old world knowledge into the new generation being born, 
who are moving further and further away from the civilization that came before the plague. Eventually he is revered as the last American alive from the old civilization, and he realises that the old world has truly gone, wondering if the new human society can survive. The character of Ish can be looked at almost as a failed messiah, similar to Paul Atreides. Earth abides in its intervening historical documents, takes on a pseudo-religious tone at times, and carries its tale of apocalyptic disaster with a reasoned balance of optimism and pessimism. The tribe, in reverting to the primitive tools such as bows and arrows, rather than the existing firearms which are no longer reliable, are learning the skills they need to survive in the post-apocalypse world. This makes them reminiscent of an inversion of the Fremen in Dune, whereas the Fremen lose their ability to live within the environment after the ecology of Arrakis changes, the generation that follows Ish are learning the skills they need to interact with their environment when all of humanity's technological achievements are slowly fading. Despite balancing the pessimism of a post-apocalyptic world with the optimism of a new generation of human beings learning to adapt to a new environment, Stuart's future world is left for the reader to imagine. Within that ambiguity there is a seed of doubt in the reader's mind, which creates an anxiety that is identifiable with Ellis's viewpoint of apocalyptic ecologism. However, like Dune, Earth Abides is fiction and therefore can be instructive to the reader without creating any real sense of fear. This apocalyptic ecologism develops throughout the 1960s, and works like Silent Spring and Where There Is Life are clearly indicative of this. They also clearly show the anxiety being generated by such environmental activists in the general public consciousness and the emerging green movement. Ecological writing of the 1970s however is much more representative of the effect of this environmental anxiety. The collective environmental message being produced during this time is one of pessimism and apocalyptic doom. The early 1970s sees a number of such works appearing. One such text first published in The Ecologist was A Blueprint for Survival. The Ecologist had been created in 1970 as a magazine to allow academics to publish radical works on a number of ecological topics. In January of 1972 an entire edition was dedicated to A Blueprint for Survival, later published in book form the same year. The text begins with a statement of support from a range of scientists of the day, before commencing with an introduction presenting the need for change in modern life. In continuing with the traditions of environmental works of the period, it is suitably apocalyptic in tone. The opening statement is as follows. The principal defect of the industrial way of life with its ethos of expansion is that it is not sustainable. Its termination within the lifetime of someone born today is inevitable. The apocalyptic tone and anxiety for the reader is therefore right from the offset before going on to examine such topics as the destruction of the ecosystem, crop failure, overuse of resources, and ultimately the collapse of society itself. The solution, presented in A Blueprint for Survival, is one of a reductionist tribal society, not altogether different from that presented in Stuart's Earth Abides. That is to say, small agrarian communities with little industrialization and a removal from central authority are seen as an ideal means by which humanity may survive the impending disaster. The need for social change is impacted upon the reader by a reinforcement of the apocalyptic tone, ever suggestive that if such change does not occur, humanity will muddle our way to extinction. Another key text to impact on the 1970s social awareness of ecological problems was The Limits to Growth a report created for the Club of Rome's project on the predicaments of humanity. The Club of Rome was formed in April 1968 and was essentially a collection of prominent ecologists, economists, scientists, industrialists and educators. The authors of this report were Donella H. Meadows, Dennis L. Meadows, Jürgen Randers and William W. Behrens III. The purpose of the report was to model a number of global trends that were of concern to the Club of Rome and did so using the World 3 computer simulation model. The purpose of this was to investigate five key areas, 
namely accelerating industrialization, rapid population growth, widespread malnutrition, depletion of non-renewable resources, and a deteriorating environment. The World 3 model was essentially a simplified mathematical computer modelling system inappropriately used to represent five incredibly complex and dynamic systems. The conclusion of the report is that all five of these modelled areas of concern are increasing exponentially and advocates limiting growth to create a sustainable equilibrium. If this is not done on a global scale, then humanity will reach the limits of growth on planet Earth within the next 100 years. Once again we have an ecological report that recognises sufficient trends in the environment and mankind's interactions with it, to provide a stark, pessimistic and apocalyptic tone to its readership before offering solutions to the problems in question. The Club of Rome's report in The Limits to Growth does present a number of possible solutions to the results created by their simplified computer model, and they differ from a blueprint for survival in that they advocate a global response and the need to see responsible development of third world countries. Despite these differences, we still see here the need for anxiety and fear to motivate the public into avoiding the forthcoming environmental apocalypse. Another work, again in the same year as these reports, was Only One Earth, The Care and Maintenance of a Small Planet by Barbara Mary Ward and René Dubois. Only One Earth was created for the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held in Stockholm. In May of 1971, Dr René Dubois was commissioned by Maurice F. Strong, the then Secretary General of the conference, to chair a group of 152 scientific and intellectual experts who would contribute as consultants to the report. The report is then authored by Wards and Dubois, but the result of a much larger collaborative effort. Primarily of concern to the report is the world of mankind, seen as a separate created environment that is distinct and at odds with that of the natural world. The introduction of the report notes some of the criticisms made at the time, some seeing it as pessimistic and others as optimistic. This is certainly a trend of these ecological writings, the pessimism creating the anxiety to then allow the advocacy of a philosophical approach which will optimistically allow humanity to survive the impending disaster. One such comment appearing in the introduction even makes the comparison of fear-mongering to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Some of the consultants feel that the general tone of Only One Earth is far too pessimistic and they see no justification in reporting on the present state of the world as if it were a fear story. One of them, indeed, sees in the style all the defects he violently objects to in Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, emotional and non-factual. Like the Club of Rome's report, Only One Earth focuses on five key topics, namely the current state of the world, science issues such as nuclear power, the development of high technology, the developing world, and the planetary biosphere. The report does emphasise the need for stewardship and sometimes views mankind in more religious overtones than as a scientific exercise, but the end result is the same. The ability of humanity to survive is brought into question, especially in the light of the nuclear arms race. Similarly to the Club of Rome's report, there is no suggestion of technological abandonment or the need to regress into tribal society, but rather the emphasis on global cooperation and responsibility. Interestingly enough, the report comments at the end if this will happen in almost pseudo science fiction tones, noting that there is not a planetary authority, or indeed, loyalty. But the idea of authority and energy and resources to support their policies seems strange, visionary, and utopian at present, simply because world institutions are not backed by any sense of planetary community and commitment. The tone of the report in Only One Earth is to an extent slightly more optimistic and more rational than those mentioned above, as it is mitigated perhaps a little unusually with a degree of Christian optimism, suggesting planetary community and love may well help us solve our problems. Nevertheless, it too carries the pessimism of an impending ecological disaster brought about by humanity's misuse of science, technology, and the environment itself. 
As such, it follows the trend Ellis describes inherent to apocalyptic ecologism, fear generating pessimism, followed by solutions that create optimism with just enough doubt to maintain anxiety. Small is Beautiful, a study of economics as if people mattered, by Ernst Friedrich Schumacher, the German born economist and statistician, provides a series of essays structured into four categories namely the modern world, resources, the third world, and organisation and ownership. Schumacher looks at the problems arising from modern day production systems created by developments over the recent centuries by philosophical and religious attitudes which are connected with mankind's attitude to nature. Schumacher views natural resources in terms of economics as not being defined as part of income, but rather as part of natural capital and therefore finite. Again, in the trend of the ecological catastrophe, he presents the notion that people are waking up to these realities which may threaten life itself, and questions why terms such as pollution, ecology and environment are suddenly coming into prominence in the general public's awareness. Schumacher's solutions to the looming problems lie to a degree in the developments of small technologies and an improvement of the way of life for mankind. His concept of Buddhist economics stands opposed to the levels of consumption in modern capitalist societies, where more is better and the level of consumption dictates the level of individual happiness. Such a modern economic viewpoint looks at labour as merely a means to an end to generate income, and therefore a cost of doing business. Schumacher states that the Buddhist viewpoint of economics from this perspective has a different attitude to work in that it will give a man a chance to utilise and develop his faculties to enable him to overcome his ego-centeredness by joining with other people in a common task, and to bring forth the goods and services needed for a becoming existence. To Schumacher, modern economic attitudes view the ownership and consumption of goods as a means to an end, and a way in which one can tally and measure the standard of living. Modern economics to Schumacher is unable to distinguish between renewable and non-renewable resources, merely seeing all things as the sole end and purpose of all economic activity. Small is Beautiful proposes a rational and conservative approach to consumption, something which ideally uses the least amount of resources, least effort, and the least destruction to attain the best possible output. Understanding the difference between resources which are finite, natural capital, and those which are renewable is essential to Buddhist economics, and strongly urges the necessity for local production of local resources for local needs. Schumacher's work combines the ideal use of technology with a proper ethos towards consumption of resources. Through this, he expresses the need to realise that certain resources are finite and irreplaceable, combined with the idea that damage to nature is not sustainable either. Schumacher's tone takes a stand against human greed as the major problem of our time, and that our environmental concerns are emerging from the consequences of that greed. Considerably less fearful in tone, Small is Beautiful nevertheless does conclude with a dire apocalyptic warning in the epilogue warning as it does of the threat that unless you seek first the kingdom of God, these other things which you also need will cease to be available to you. There is a great deal in these ecological works that we can see being represented in Herbert's Dune series. Unfortunately the tone of this apocalyptic ecology seems to be a means of garnering public attention and approval for the concerns of the growing environmental movement of the time. As Ellis notes, the Dune series is mapping fictionally the discursive modes within which the ecological debate about America's future was being conducted. As such, perhaps one of the reasons for the enduring attention it receives is because as much as it too may be a long term representation of apocalyptic ecology, through the medium of science fiction a different tone is generated. The Dune series and George R. Stewart's Earth Abides alike are able to present these growing ecological and environmental concerns through entertainment 
removing the anxiety and fear that ecological writing was instilling on the wider general public. The success of Dune owes much to the developing popular awareness of environmental issues emerging out of the 1960s. Dune stands apart from many other works of science fiction which feature environmental disasters, rather than any real observation or exploration of ecological and environmental issues. However, the continued success of Dune, despite initially being rejected by so many publishers, has led to further developments in science fiction, and meant that the ecological science fiction novel has been allowed to grow up, maturing in a manner that shows it has left behind its environmental catastrophe predecessors. Dune's popular and critical success as a work of ecological science fiction has opened the door for other authors to explore contemporary environmental issues in a more considered fashion other than the apocalyptic natural disaster. Such works surely include Sherry S. Tepper's Grass, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy and the Orange County Trilogy, Adam Roberts's Salt, and Joan Slonczewski's own response to Dune itself, A Door into Ocean. Much of A Door into Ocean reflects my responses to Frank Herbert's Dune, and to Ursula Le Guin's The Word for World is Forest. Dune depicts a world covered entirely by desert. To a biologist, the limitations of such a world are clear. No desert ecosystem can exist without moisture evaporated from ocean and carried by air currents. It was a natural step to imagine the opposite, a world covered entirely by water, which the Earth may well have been early in our planet's history. Dune depicts several male dominated societies whose members scheme and oppress one another. The psychology of the characters is compelling, and study of it was helpful for me. Nevertheless, the societies in Dune are all limited to those dominated by males and violence. Even the female Bene Gesserit use violent means and direct most of their scheming towards manipulation of males. Thus, in Ocean I attempted to oppose the Dune concept by depicting ocean dwelling females in non violent revolution who succeed without losing their humanity, as Paul and the Fremen sadly do. Slonczewski's viewpoint here presents a critical stance of Dune in terms of its accurate scientific depiction of the ecology of Arrakis. It is a viewpoint that fails to observe the details of Herbert's work, and looking at Dune itself as an isolated text rather than part of a larger intended sequence. From the very beginning of conceiving Dune, Herbert's intent and in conception was to subvert the reader's viewpoint of the hero and the messianic convulsions that periodically overtake us. Herbert spent some six years researching Dune, and the writing process took one and a half years. But from the outset, the whole story was conceived as a long novel, the whole trilogy as one book. During the writing of Dune, Herbert noted the work was getting bigger and bigger, and at one point informed his agent Lurton Blasingham that it might reach over a million words. He finally started putting his worries aside and worked from a bottom up approach, determining where the story needed to go and what he desired to achieve with the final product. In doing this, Herbert said, I started building from the back. Where does it have to go? So parts of Children of Dune and Dune Messiah were already written before I completed Dune. It is therefore necessary to always examine the first Dune trilogy as a collective whole, rather than as separate entities. If one does not do this, as a number of commentators have, then they miss Frank Herbert's very deliberate, long term rhythm in Dune. The inversion of Herbert's Dune series truly begins with Dune Messiah, where to our horror we discover that Paul Moadib Atreides as Emperor has unleashed the Fremen upon a jihad which has resulted in the slaughter of billions, and the beginnings of what will be in terms of ecological time, a swift and sudden transformation of the environment of Arrakis. Slonczewski's view of the limitations of Herbert's Arrakis as a fully realised and plausible ecosystem is based on the fact that the vast deserts of this strange world cannot be conceived without moisture if evaporated from ocean and carried by air currents. Arrakis is a world that has had its original ecosystem fully transformed by the arrival of an introduced species, 
And indeed, in Children of Dune, we are told by Leto II that it was once a wet planet, where now the white gypsum pans attested to bygone lakes and seas. In the first appendix of Dune entitled The Ecology of Dune, there is much more information readily available to the reader, and again, Slonczewski in her above remarks seems unaware of its content. In beginning his ecological surveys of the planet's ecosystem, when observing from the air after being accidentally blown off course, Pardot Kynes realises that this desert world was once a world that contained much surface water. When the storm passed, there was the Pan, a giant oval depression some 300 kilometres on the long axis, a glaring white surprise in the open desert. Kynes landed, tasted the Pan's storm cleaned surface. Salt. Now, he was certain. There'd been open water on Arrakis, once. He began re examining the evidence of the dry wells where trickles of water had appeared and vanished, never to return. Ecologically speaking, there is more to Arrakis than meets the eye of the casual observer, and it is perhaps for this reason alone that its popularity remains undiminished, despite lacklustre interest from the critical science fiction community. Slonczewski's distaste for violence in Dune, perpetuated as she sees it by male orientated societies, and to a certain extent by the female Bene Gesserit, also demonstrates a lack of understanding of Herbert's intent and again a failure to examine the Dune series as a whole. As a female school, the Bene Gesserit are the main representation of women in the Imperium, and with some exceptions, most female characters are members of this secretive order. But again there is no consideration of either the God Emperor's all-female army of fish speakers, or the honoured matres from Heretics of Dune and Chapterhouse Dune. Violence is not the key to understanding Paul Atreides or the Fremen, and it is interesting to note that Slonczewski believes that both lose their humanity because of it. In actuality, the Fremen are reduced to their museum status because of the loss of the harsh Arrakis environment, which makes them soft, and is a comment more on the process of natural selection and the conditions for the so called survival of the fittest. Paul's failure as the Kwisatz Sadarach is not that he loses his humanity, but that he is actually incapable of losing it. He is unable to bring about the golden path that he initiates because a part of him is incapable of inflicting so much death and destruction on mankind, but fundamentally because he cannot give up his humanity to do so. It is Leto II who truly understands what terrible sacrifice is required to create the golden path, and his symbiosis with the sand trout creates the inhuman transformation necessary to see the evolutionary plan through. Violence however is in one sense key to understanding Herbert's approach to ecology in the Dune series, believing as he did that force was the key tool of western man in dealing with any given problem, and especially in the general terms of his approach to living and interacting with his environment. We play the game today with counters called money, and we talk about laws of supply and demand and so on. There is a law of supply and demand, and there is no problem which won't submit to this approach, even the problem of our own ignorance. This assumption, you see, throws it out the window right there, because it is an asinine assumption, and the basic fallacy of western man's approach to living. Now, I'm not saying that we should immediately drop this and adopt a Vedanta way of thinking. We need what I would call a science of wisdom. The moral norm, as I try to show in June, is something imposed upon people by their environment. Ethical law takes a step in another direction, and it says that I, the thinking animal, see the logical consequences of these moral actions, and maybe I'd better modify the moral law slightly by a higher ethical law. Dune shows the conflict between absolutes and the necessity of the moment. You might say it is an exercise in showing up the fallacy of absolutism. For Frank Herbert, the material that eventually led to developing his own ecological ideas began in 1953. During this time he was working as a yellow journalist, and was sent to research an environmental story in Florence, Oregon. 
The article was about an attempt by the US Forest Service to use the planting of barrier grasses, rather than a human engineered solution, to prevent moving sands from encroaching upon highways and roads. At one point the sands even threatened to encroach upon the town of Florence itself. Although the article was never published, it began Herbert's fascination with sand dunes and the desert. This fascination would take his research down many different paths, at the end of which he realised he had collected a vast amount of information relating to the ecology of deserts. As such, he felt this was a suitable topic that he could extrapolate, and from which he could produce a work of science fiction. I finally saw I had something enormously interesting going for me about the ecology of deserts, and it was, for a science fiction writer anyway, an easy step from that to think, what if I had an entire planet that was desert? During my studies of deserts, of course, and previous studies of religions, I had seen that many religions began in a desert atmosphere. I decided to put the two together because I don't think that any one story should have any one thread. Frank's enthusiasm for the subject shows readily in his letters to his agent Lurton Blasingham, and in particular his fascination with the concept of ecologists regarding the nature of sand dunes as being synonymous to waves at sea. To Herbert's enthrallment, the difficulties in overcoming an age-old problem of sand encroachment had finally been mastered by viewing sand dunes in this way for the first time, that is, much akin to the theories of fluid mechanics. In studying the desert, Frank also came to research those peoples that live in such regions of the world, who have adapted systems of successful living often as vital integral parts of their own ecosystems. These peoples, from desert cultures all around the world, also embedded a sense of romantic mystique with Frank. The differences in the interaction of these cultures and their environments, compared against the way people from western cultures conversely seem to tame and conquer their environment, was all too apparent to him. It's my belief for a long time that man inflicts himself on his environment. In western culture we tend to think that we can overcome nature by mechanical means. We accumulate enough data and we subdue it. This is a one-pointed vision of man, because if you really started looking at man, western man, you'll see that you could cut him right down the middle and he's blind on that backside. It was for this reason that Herbert claimed it was very important that the one man who represents the viewpoint of a western man, namely Liet Kint, the imperial planetologist, is actually killed by the planet that he seeks to tame and transform. Kynes is indeed the scientist, who has a thorough if incomplete understanding of the interactions of the planet's ecosystem, and it is his approach to transforming the ecology of Arrakis that is both mechanical and short-sighted. Even though his viewpoint is that of a long-term ecological transformation, his outlook is not nearly long-term enough, and although Kynes has virtually become a Fremen, like Paul Atreides, Perhaps his ultimate feeling is that he is in actuality not a Fremen, but a man of the Imperium who attempts to serve two masters. Whereas the Fremen are perfectly attuned to the environment, despite his great knowledge, he is not, and as Herbert puts it, is unaware that he is still a part of this system and out of rhythm with it. From these beginnings did the various facets of the ecology of the desert begin in Herbert's mind, but it was not until some ten years later that Dune would be ready for publication in its serial form in Analog magazine, and some two years later before it was published as a novel. The length of research that Herbert put into his work was voluminous, and there are examples of this interest in ecology appearing in his first book, The Dragon in the Sea. This novel received much acclaim when published in 1956, and was his only work other than short stories between then and the publication of Dune. As such it shares many themes and motifs with Dune, especially those of psychology, religion and ecology. Of particular note in The Dragon in the Sea is man's relationship with his environment, which in this case is the artificial and hermetic ecosystem of a small submarine, and especially the psychological pressures placed upon those who live and interact within it. The added pressure, 
the book is also known as Under Pressure, of living within a hermetically sealed environment while surrounded by another environment which can prove immediately fatal to the men of the submarine, has many echoes to the harsh nature of Arrakis and to those who live there. The precious nature of oil and the extreme dangers to which the crew of the Fenian Ram have to go through in order to procure it, shows Herbert's interest in hydraulic despotism, an ecological sub-theme he carries on in June with the mining of the spice melange. Few works of science fiction have presented such a detailed ecological creation as the world of Arrakis, also known as Dune. Dune was the first science fiction novel to present a world with a fully realised and detailed ecology of its own, and it is for this reason that it can be seen as truly groundbreaking and ahead of its time. Gwyneth Jones, when discussing the icons of science fiction, said that Herbert's Dune was the most admired of living imagined worlds the arid planet terrain and its extraordinary wildlife that catches the reader's imagination. With Arrakis we are presented with a world that has the harshest of environments imaginable while still capable of sustaining life. The Fremen who live there have adapted every single mode of living, from the political, religious, social, martial and even economic, to the necessities of the planet's ecology. The adaption of their life systems is done out of one simple natural requisite, the need to survive. At their roots, Fremen remained special application animals, desert survivors, governance experts under conditions of stress. Out of this immediate requirement comes a long term goal, where the individual and collective Fremen act as geomorphic agents, with the desire to eventually change their desert world into an Eden-like paradise, a world lush and verdant where they hope one day their descendants will live easier and simpler lives. The ecology of Arrakis in one way governs the needs of the entire Imperium of Shaddam IV, and later the Empire of the Atreides. All of human civilization depends on the one great natural resource of this barren wasteland, the Spice Melange. It is the dependency on this unusual drug, which can also be seen in terms of a fuel, that creates the hydraulic despotism of the Imperium. To understand the complexity of the story of Dune is to understand Herbert's creation of this strange desert planet and its ecosystem, the utter dependency of the people of the Imperium on the spice melange, and the drug's relationship to the sandworms of the desert. Dryland ecology is the most detailed and explored of Dune's major themes, and from the offset this is made clear by the book's initial dedication. It reads as follows. To the people whose labours go beyond ideas into the realm of real materials, to the dryland ecologists, wherever they may be, in whatever time they work, this effort at prediction is dedicated in humility and admiration. Herbert's ideas of ecology as a long term process are fundamental to the creation of this world and the enormous scale of his story. They are also a comment on the westernised systems of thought that circulate regarding ecology and the nature of the catastrophe that awaits humanity. Essential to these ideas is the use of human beings as tools for geological management and change. The spice melange is also an important allegory to humanity's dependency on natural resources. The consequences to society when control over such a resource is absolute is the economic and political concept of hydraulic despotism. For this reason, water and melange are an exact analogue of oil scarcity and clean potable water. Chome, the Combine Honnet Ober Advancer Mercantilis, the corporate entity that together with the Spacing Guild controls all trade in the Imperium, was in Frank Herbert's mind not just an allegory for OPEC, the organisation of the petroleum exporting countries, he goes as far to say Chome is OPEC. Melange exists on only one world in the known universe, namely Arrakis, and cannot be found or transplanted anywhere else. Ecology is intrinsically linked with Frank Herbert's concerns of environmentalism being used as part of a political motivation by leaders seeking a new crusade for their own aggrandizement. Ecology might be the next banner for demagogues and would-be heroes, 
for the power seekers and others ready to find an adrenaline high in the launching of a new crusade. Before proceeding, it is best to clarify some key terms, the most important of which is that of ecology. Frank Herbert had his own views on how to define ecology, and these are presented within the text of Dune and reiterated therein. Herbert's understanding of ecology is that the highest function of ecology is understanding consequences. Herbert in this case was actually misquoting Paul Sears from his book Where There Is Life, a text which serves as an introductory work to the layman on ecology. In the collected insights of Frank Herbert in The Maker of Dune, Herbert claims that he didn't recall where he heard this quotation and would like to attribute it. The footnote to the text informing us that it is indeed Sears' book, Where There Is Life, then repeats this misquotation in all certainty. The quotation is in fact about science in general rather than ecology, and is the highest function of science is to give us an understanding of consequences. There is no reason, however, that Herbert cannot apply this to ecology in the specific. After all, modern ecology is regarded as a science up to a point. See Sears's following definition. It would seem that a great deal of Herbert's understanding of ecology, at least initially in June, would come from Paul Sears's books, and there is even an indication that reading Sears may have led Herbert to the works of Samuel Butler. Sears himself viewed ecology as less a science in the conventional sense than a method of approach that draws upon the best information it can get from whatever source. The ecologist tries to assess this information with scientific rigour and as far as possible in his research to use scientific controls. Herbert's idea of ecology is a very broad definition then, and quite different from the following presented in the Concise Oxford Dictionary. Ecology, 9. The branch of biology concerned with the relations of organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. Origin, 19th century, as oecology, from the Greek oikos, house. Herbert's own complex consideration of ecology meant that he viewed the subject as a human undertaking that had at its core the understanding of intricate systems, subsystems, processes, entities and relationships that make up an ecosystem. A system is defined as a complex whole, a set of things working together as a mechanism or interconnecting network, and an ecosystem is a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. Liet Kynes, the primary ecologist of Arrakis, who prefers the term planetologist, makes the following observations, which are paradoxically very much Herbert's own views while simultaneously being those of Western man. The thing the ecologically illiterate don't realise about an ecosystem, Kynes said, is that it's a system. A system. A system maintains a certain fluid stability that can be destroyed by a misstep in just one niche. A system has order, a flowing from point to point. If something dams that flow, order collapses. The untrained might miss that collapse until it was too late. That's why the highest function of ecology is the understanding of consequences. Had they achieved a system? In addition to the complexities presented by an ecosystem, Herbert's tribal Fremen, a people who have been forced to change every aspect of their lives to accommodate surviving on the harsh world of Arrakis, represent a deeper understanding of ecology. Their actions as geomorphic agents present a long-term view of the subject, but perhaps more importantly, that ecology as a science and endeavour has many shapes and forms within the human sphere of influence. As such, ecology has many subsystems that make up the whole of the science. However, trying to nail down Frank Herbert's attitude to systems is difficult, as the author once again presents a paradoxical and conflicting viewpoint. Herbert's work is often perceived as promoting systemic thinking, and especially the ability to do so in the long term. However, Frank Herbert has also commented on the fact that systems are dangerous, though in this case he is discussing the systems of power and control that develop around those who are viewed by society as larger than life, that is, heroes. It is the systems themselves that I see as dangerous. Systematic is a deadly word, 
systems originate with human creators, with people who employ them. Systems take over and grind on and on. They are like a flood tide that picks up everything in its path. How do they originate? For this reason, the Fremen's attitude to ecology is multifaceted, incorporating the subject into every sphere of their lives by creating systems. Tuponce points out in his work which focuses heavily on the language of Dune, especially as a polyphonic novel, ecology therefore has a much broader meaning than the mere study of organisms and their interaction with their environments. It can mean globally social ecology, political ecology, economic ecology, and even language. I would add to this depiction religious ecology as fundamentally important to all of the above meanings, because it is by the religion of the Fremen that all of their subsystemic viewpoints of their environmental interactions are governed. The ecological viewpoint that Herbert presents us with in Dune begins with the arrival of the Atreides on the planet Arrakis as they begin to undertake control of the production of Melange for the Emperor Shaddam IV. Up until this time, the Harkonnens have governed the world, holding the planet in quasi-fife under a Chum company contract to mine the geriatric spice Melange. The world of Arrakis is a polarised change for the Atreides, who come from a planet called Caladan, opposite in many ways to their new home, being rich in the natural resources of water, oceans and seas. This is a stark contrast to Arrakis, a world where there is no precipitation and where water is so scarce that its conservation is paramount to survival and where its ownership is even used to indicate an individual's wealth. It is interesting to note that as we follow the story of Dune throughout the several thousand years in which it takes place, we see the planet Arrakis go through several severe ecological transformations. At first it is a desert planet, with few places where human beings can seemingly survive, before being slowly transformed by Paul Moadib Atreides, and later to a greater extent by the Atreides regent Alia. This transformation begins to destroy the desert regions in favour of more verdant and lush areas that are increasingly suitable for sustaining life. Over the next three and a half thousand years, Leto II has totally transformed the world to such an extent that Arrakis has become an Eden-like planet, with only one small desert remaining at the Emperor's Sarir. With the death of Leto II and the reintroduction of the sand trout vectors, Arrakis once again returns to a desert world as the giant worms are slowly repopulated and the returning sand trout insist all surface water. Eventually the planet Arrakis is destroyed by the honoured Matres using their obliterators, and the world succumbs to the machinations of those who seek to control the spice melange. Arrakis was once very ecologically different to when we first see it with the arrival of House Atreides in the year 10191. Prior to this, some time in the distant past not alluded to specifically, the planet was a wet world with a very different ecosystem to the one it later developed. Only once are we given any indication as to what caused the vast changes that transformed the planet from a world of oceans to a world of deserts. In Children of Dune, Leto II reveals what occurred to his twin sister Ganema as he probes his other memory. Yet water had been known here in prehistoric times. White gypsum pans attested to bygone lakes and seas, wells deep drilled found water which Santrout sealed off. As clearly as if he'd witnessed the events, he saw what had happened on this planet, and it filled him with foreboding for the cataclysmic changes which human intervention was bringing. His voice barely above a whisper, he said, I know what happened, Ganema. She bent close to him. Yes? The sand trout. He fell silent and she wondered why he kept referring to the haploid phase of the planet's giant sandworm, but she dared not prod him. The sand trout, he repeated, was introduced here from some other place. This was a wet planet then. They proliferated beyond the capability of existing ecosystems to deal with them. Sand trout insisted the available free water made this a desert planet, and they did it to survive. In a planet sufficiently dry, they could move to their sandworm phase. 
The sandworms, and more importantly the sand trout vector that is part of their life cycle, are not indigenous to Arrakis, though no suggestion is ever provided as to their origins. Like most species on Arrakis, they have at some stage been brought there, though the majority of other species introduced to the planet have been done so after the desertification of the world by the sand trout. The relationship between the sandworms, the desert, water, and melange is vital to understanding the ecology of Arrakis. It is the introduction of the sand trout or little makers stage of the sandworm life cycle that brought about the destruction of Arrakis's original ecosystems and began the process of transforming the world into the desert planet called Dune. Few seem to understand the nature of the transformation process or the relationship between the worms and the spice, with perhaps the exception of Leotkines and the Fremen. The sand trout are known as little makers, and described as the half plant, half animal, deep sand vector of the Arrakis sandworm. The little makers' excretions form the pre spice mass. Their initial introduction to the world of Arrakis is never speculated on by Herbert, and remains one of the novel's unsolved mysteries. Their impact upon the world of Arrakis is however ecologically catastrophic to the planet's original environment, and is synonymous with similar environmental catastrophes involving introduced species. An obvious example was the introduction of the cane toad Bufo Marinus in Australia from the 1930s onwards, in order to deal with an indigenous species of the cane beetle Dermolepida albohirtum. The cane toads developed exponentially in the northeastern regions of Australia, where they have no major natural predators. As a result, they have become one of the country's biggest pests and a huge threat to the biodiversity of Australia. Another such example is the creature that Frank Herbert most likely based his sand trout and sandworms upon, namely the sea lamprey, Petromyzon marinus. The sea lamprey has become a major problem in the Great Lakes region of the USA and Canada, where they have decimated local fish populations. The sea lamprey not only bears a remarkable physical similarity to Herbert's sandworms, but its life cycle is in itself not altogether dissimilar. Now they had the circular relationship. Little maker to pre-spice mass. Little maker to shy halud. Shy halud to scatter the spice upon which fed microscopic creatures called sand plankton. The sand plankton, food for shy halud, growing, burrowing, becoming little makers. The similarity of the sandworm life cycle to that of the sea lamprey is also comparable when we consider Herbert's viewpoint of the desert sands being similar to oceans and their movement being governed by fluid mechanics. In particular the sea lamprey's sedentary stage is compatible to the sand trout stage of metamorphosis as it enters into a period of hibernation to emerge as a small worm after five to six years. The sand trout stage of the sandworm life cycle is inevitably drawn towards water, which they close off, absorbing it wherever they find it. For what purpose is somewhat a mystery, but as the sand trout goes through this process, creating the pre-spice mass through its excretions and ultimately melange and sand plankton, they are unable to proceed to the final stage of their life cycle whilst large bodies of water remain. The latter stage of their life cycle, the sandworm, has a fatal aversion to water and the sand trout do not begin the process of transformation until all such water is gone. The Fremen use the stunted form of sandworm to create the poisonous water of life, which they obtain by drowning the creature in water. It is through this powerful awareness spectrum narcotic that they are able to create their own reverend mothers, and through their transmutation of the drug into a safer form, the siege orgies that are ritualistically performed by the Fremen are able to occur. Again here is an example of the Fremen interaction with their ecosystem which is incorporated into their religious, social, and sexual practices. The life cycle of the sandworm then, in order to reach its culmination, must by necessity transform the planet they are introduced to into a barren desert wasteland devoid of almost all water. Various factions try to break the monopoly that Arrakis has on melange production, 
by attempting to capture and transplant the worms to other planets. This always fails with the death of the transplanted worms, usually because they are introduced to pre-existing desert regions. It highlights the failure by almost everyone to fully understand the relationship between the worm's life cycle and their environment, though it shows at least an acknowledgement of a suspected relationship between the worms and the spice. In addition to the destruction of water on the planet Arrakis, the sandworms perform one very important function. Many plant species once native to Arrakis become extinct after the arrival of the sand trout on the planet, and those few that survived and later transplanted were excellently adapted to survive in such a harsh environment. But with so few plants on Arrakis, the question arises as to where the near perfect oxygen nitrogen carbon dioxide mix comes from. This mystery, the obvious gap in the planet's ecosystem, was apparent to Pardo Kynes, the planet's imperial ecologist. It is the worms themselves that fill this obvious ecological gap, doing so via their internal digestive factory with its enormous concentrations of aldehydes and acids, a giant source of oxygen. Pardot notes that a medium sized worm of about 200 metres in length is capable of putting into the atmosphere as much oxygen as 10 square kilometres of green growing photosynthesis surface. When cast out in the desert to die by the Harkonnens, Leotkinds recalls his father's words. The Arakeen environment built itself into the evolutionary pattern of native life forms, his father said. How strange that so few people ever looked up from the spice long enough to wonder at the near ideal nitrogen oxygen CO2 balance being maintained here in the absence of large areas of plant cover. The energy sphere of the planet is there to see and understand. A relentless process, but a process nonetheless. There is a gap in it. Then something occupies that gap. Science is made up of so many things that appear obvious after they are explained. I knew the little maker was there, deep in the sand, long before I ever saw it. Adam Roberts sees this as representative of the sketchy and error-filled representation of Dune's extreme environment, as he questions how oxygen is produced on Arrakis. He points out that Herbert suggests that the sandworms fart oxygen, which hardly addresses the problem. But I would add that Herbert is suggesting that the digestive factories of the worms is presented as an alien alternative to the creation of the nitrogen-oxygen CO2 balance which would be maintained by large areas of plant life. Nevertheless I would agree with David M. Lawrence who, when discussing the ecology of Arrakis in relation to its massive sandstorms, points out that readers of science fiction and fantasy are expected to suspend disbelief. Disbelief is required when Herbert described the sandstorms that raged across the surface of Arrakis. The sandworms are enormous in size, with some growing longer than 400 metres in length, with Paul noting at one point that I've seen space frigates that were smaller. The Atreides first encounter a worm when being given a tour of a spice mining operation in the desert. As they observe from their ornithopter, Duke Leto is the first to spot worm sign. The telltale warnings that a worm is on its way to devour the harvester factory, which mines the spice. As the Duke points to the worm sign, Paul sees the crescent dune tracks spread shadow ripples towards the horizon, and running through them as a level line stretching into the distance came an elongated mount in motion, a cresting of sand, and notes how it reminds him of a large fish swimming just below the surface. The nature of the worms themselves as territorial creatures means that they defend the spice grounds which are mined by the harvesters. The worms are attracted to vibrations created by the mining process, and aerial spotters and seismic probes are deployed to constantly keep vigil for worm sign. Once worm sign is spotted, a carryall descends to the surface where it lifts the harvester away to safety. When the Atreides first encounter a worm at a spice mining facility, they are forced to evacuate the harvester's crew, as the Harkonnen have sabotaged the carryall. The giant worm arrives and consumes the entire factory. The vibrations that attract the sandworms also mean that the use of Holtzman shields on Arrakis is often very quickly fatal to those who use them, 
as they completely enrage the sandworms. When asked about the use of shields, Kynes points out, Activate a shield within the worm zone and you seal your fate. Worms ignore territory lines, come from far around to attack a shield. No man wearing a shield has ever survived such attack. The worms are incredibly tough and resistant to most weaponry, the exception being water, which is fatal to them, and something that Kynes fails to mention to the Duke and his staff. High voltage electrical shock applied separately to each ring segment is the only known way of killing and preserving an entire worm, Kynes said. They can be stunned and shattered by explosives, but each ring segment has a life of its own. Barring atomics, I know of no explosive powerful enough to destroy a large worm entirely. They're incredibly tough. Why hasn't an effort been made to wipe them out? Paul asked. Too expensive, Kynes said. Too much area to cover. Paul leaned back in his corner. His truth sense, awareness of tone shadings, told him that Kynes was lying and telling half-truths. And he thought, if there's a relationship between spice and worms, killing the worms would destroy the spice. The initial encounter with the worm is not as up close and personal as the next time Paul encounters one, fleeing with his mother into the deep desert from the Harkonnen. At this point, Paul and Jessica are surviving, using what knowledge they have of Arrakis and wearing still suits and other frame kit equipment left for them. In an attempt to reach the safety of rock, they plant a thumper, a piece of equipment used to attract a worm when crossing open desert. The thumper sets a continual series of noises in motion that attracts a worm to its location, and here, its use by Paul and his mother nearly results in their death. When a worm encounters a thumper, they usually devour it, and once this has happened, the creature heads towards the two fugitives. They only escape because the Fremen, who have been secretly observing them, set another thumper in action. The Fremen use the thumper to summon worms in order to use them to travel upon for long distances across the desert, with the use of maker hooks, which they use for capturing, mounting and steering the worms. Understanding the nature of the worms has allowed them to travel in relative safety across the desert sands between sieges, and the Fremen when travelling on foot do so by walking without rhythm, so that they sound like the natural shifting of sand, like the wind. The only sounds that the sandworms tend not to investigate are those that appear to have a natural origin. Paul and Jessica survive the encounter with the worm, and have a precarious meeting with the Fremen led by Stilgar, but not before Paul is able to experience the worm's presence at a very short distance. He found himself registering every available aspect of the thing that lifted from the sand there seeking him. Its mouth was some 80 metres in diameter, crystal teeth with the curved shape of Chris knives glinting around the rim, the bellows breath of cinnamon, subtle aldehydes, acids. The worm blotted out the moonlight as it brushed the rocks above them, a shower of small stones and sand cascaded into the narrow hiding place. Paul crowded his mother farther back. Cinnamon! The smell of it flooded across him. What has the worm to do with the spice melange? He asked himself, and he remembered Liat Kynes betraying a veiled reference to some association between worm and spice. <laughs>